Providence family, it's so good to see you today. Hope that you are doing well and hope you've had a good week. If you're a guest here with us, uh, again, we're so thankful that you are here. I want to invite you back tonight at 6 o'clock for a really special, we do this once a summer, uh, a night of worship, and uh, it's called Selah, okay, Selah. Now, there's a group um, that, uh, you know, makes songs and they do concerts, and they're not going to be here, okay? This is not a concert in that way. Um, we're going to be the group. We're going to sing as the church family. And um, the word Selah actually comes from the Bible. It's used 74 times uh, in the Old Testament, every time with music and a song. And it means to pause or to think about it or even to raise the voice. And so what you'll find if you look at the Psalms and you read through them, you'll find a psalm, which is a song that was sung. And, um, and oftentimes um, in the actual book of the Bible, you'll, you'll, you'll see a pause, a little space. And if you look over to the right, you'll find this word Selah. And it was there intentionally. And it simply means that as they were singing through the song, there was a time that perhaps in between verses, there was a moment to pause, to think, and to consider his sovereignty, his goodness, what they were singing about, about God's mercies, compassion. And so there was a time to pause, to think. And then it moved into the next stanza where they would raise their voice even louder. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to pray some, we're going to sing a lot, and um, I hope you can be here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you, and thank you for the privilege to wake up and to live in your world today. Your word says that the wage of sin is death, and we're all sinners, and therefore today we've all received mercy because we woke up. And with that mercy, we know that you have given us responsibility and instruction on how to live in your world, and we want to yield to that instruction. And so we ask now as we open your word that you would open up our heart, that God, I pray that my words would be pleasing to you as would all the thoughts and meditations of our heart. Lord, as we look at two passages from your word that deal with our responsibility and civil duty, politics, government, would you protect us from our natural sinful propensity of trying to find proof from Scripture that endorses our ideologies? And instead, would you help us to lay our ideas and ideologies down and say, would you inform all of them? And so instead of Standing over your word this morning, we want to sit under it. And would you do good to your people as we humble ourselves before you and ask you to teach us? We pray in Christ's name, amen. The term politics has become so tangled and entwined with a lot of things that aren't so positive, like fear and disorder and dishonor and rage and corruption and division and deception that many people, including believers, want to disengage altogether. This is why it's really important for us to have a healthy view of even the words that we use. The word politics comes from a Greek word, polis, means city. And from that Greek word, we not only get politics, we get policy, police, polity, which means that within the city, there's laws and rules, there's enforcement of those laws and rules, and there's even a process by which we make those laws and rules. At its root form, Politics is about community. It's about how we live and how we relate to one another in community within borders. Those borders might be inside the church and outside the church. It might be inside this school or outside this school. It might be this state or this city or this country. But all these places that have Borders and boundaries where we're thinking about how we relate to one another, they all fit in God's world. And he's the owner of all of it. 
And therefore, if you understand that politics really is about how we live and relate with one another in God's world, then you have to understand that if God's people who have been entrusted with his word that gives instruction on not just life, but how life can flourish in his world, if we disengage altogether from politics, then not only our society, but our call from Christ to love our neighbor as ourself will be compromised. There is a way to participate that is faithful to the Lord and helpful to society. And so we start a series today called God and or Country. Some of us, um, we even say God and country. And we have a thought of what that means. Others of us look at it and go, well, is, is it God and or is it God or country? Which one is it? It is a pretty nuanced thing. But let me just remind you of something. Just hours before Jesus went to the cross, he stood on trial before Pilate. And Pilate, who was the Roman governor, he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responded with such wisdom, of course. And what he said was, well, you said such, and I want you to know something, is that my kingdom is not of this world. I am a king. I have a kingdom. And that kingdom is not of this world. Well, as their trial went on, we're, we're, we're told there that eventually Jesus became silent, that he wouldn't answer anything else. And Pilate became irritated with him, so much so that he says, don't you understand, Jesus, that I have the authority to crucify you or not? And Jesus responds, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. And what this means is that Jesus Christ has authority over the city of God, and he also has authority over the city of man. He has authority over his kingdom, and he has authority over all kings in the cities of man. And so the question that we want to think about is how do we live as citizens in this world, in this nation, when Jesus, if we have placed our faith in Jesus, has made us citizens of his kingdom that's not of this world? And so over the next three weeks, we're going to look at three different messages. The first is today, the king of two cities. If you have a Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn with me to Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Next week, we'll look at citizens of two cities. Now, hopefully, I've done enough warm-up that you know that I'm not talking about like Raleigh and Charlotte, okay? It's the city of God, city of man. And then the third sermon will be voting while conscious of the king trying to give some handles on how do we participate in this process of an election. Now, I need to tell you that on this third sermon, I won't be with you. Our oldest son will be married that weekend, and I promised my wife about eight months ago that I would be emotionally present that weekend. And, um, and so I'm, I won't actually do that. It'll be an amazing sermon. It's probably going to be the best sermon you've ever heard in your life. But I also had a few thoughts on the issue, and so I wrote an article, and it was posted. It's called A Voter's Guide for the Heart, and you can find it if you want at pray.org slash info. You can find the link there. Inside the article, it simply talks about how do we guard our heart over the next 100 days? What is the instruction from God's word about voting? Should we even do it or not? And then third is how would we go about doing it in a way that he would help us to make that choice? It's going to be different than any voter guide, perhaps, that you've seen, but I hope that it will be helpful to you, and I hope that it points your heart to Christ. But today we look at the king of two cities, and so let's read Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the all these authorities, all authorities, all governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no one or no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. 
For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And so, after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the rest of the New Testament features a number of letters that were written to churches. Some pastors, many churches, offering instruction on how to live, on how should people who have put their faith in Christ, who have come together as a people of God, who are a little who are a local lighthouse in different cities and villages in the known world, and how they are to participate in society and finance and in all things. And so there's letters. And what's interesting is in all these letters, there are two passages that we just read that are the most direct instruction on how we as people who have entered into the kingdom of Christ, how we're supposed to participate in the kingdoms of this world. And what you find in each of these two passages that we just read, first of all, they overlap. There's, there's, they're, they're, it, it's the same principal ideas. And what you find is in each of these, there are three different focal points. The first is the sovereignty and the justice of God. The second is the role of government. And the third is our response to the government if we understand that God is sovereign and that he is just. And so really what I've done is I've written a seven-part sermon, and I can only get through three points today. And so next week, okay, we're going to come back to the exact same two texts. This week, we look at the first two, God's sovereignty and justice, and what is the role of human government. And then next week, we'll look at our response if we believe such. So the first thing I want you to see is that Christ is the sovereign king of heaven and earth. This is perhaps the most important, gracious, kind thing Paul and Peter do for us is that once introducing an arena that has the capacity to distract and pull our attention because of this overwhelming fear, he grabs our chin and he forces us to look at Christ. Notice what he does in Romans chapter 13, six times in six verses. There's no authority except from God. That's the anchor. It's been instituted by God. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. He is the servant of God. He carries out God's wrath. They're ministers of God. And Peter does the exact same thing. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake. This is the will of God, living as servants of God, fear God. Over and over, you see this cadence where he's placing God up on this pedestal, and he's saying you have to keep your eyes on him if you're going to engage in the political process in a healthy way. Because he is the king, the sovereign one over heaven and earth. Now, before Romans 13, there's 12 chapters in Romans where Paul is establishing the fact that it is Jesus Christ who is God, who is Lord. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, he does the same. And so when, we're, when, when it says here over and over, God, 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 what he's saying is this, is that Christ, it is Jesus, the Christ, Jesus who is the Christ, who is the Son of God, is sovereign over all things. He's the Lord. Romans chapter 11 says, from him and through him and to him are all things. That means that all peoples and all governments, all rulers, all judges, all principles, doesn't matter what it is. If you have authority, all of it, all of us 
We all come from him, we exist through him, and one day we will all return and stand before him and give an account. Every single nation in the world, including America, is much like this bucket. We wonder who's going to lead within the bucket. We have these borders, and they're like, this is our country. This is who we are. And so some, like us, they get to vote for leaders. Over the next 100 days, we're going to see all kinds of arguing over who leads inside the bucket. But let me tell you something. Jesus is the one who rules the bucket and the beach. It doesn't matter what's in or out. He owns all of it. He owns all people. It's all his, all his. He is the sovereign king of the world. He is the head of all rule and authority, Paul writes. He is the ruler of the kings on earth. That means he rules the kingdom that is not of this world and every king in this world and his th- from his throne spills such goodness and kindness and sovereignty and justice that he is worthy of being trusted. He's the king. Now, what I've found even this morning is that there are many people who want to establish that and then remove that from their consciousness because what they really care about is party politics. And the New Testament won't let you brush the sovereignty of God into a corner so that we can hold fast to our ideologies He establishes Christ as supreme. We all live in a constitutional republic, and you also live under one divine, eternal monarch. And as such, let me give you two applications. First, let's seek shelter in Christ. Why shelter? What does that have to do with anything? Well, both parties in America, as all pretty much all political parties where there's a voting process, they peddle fear. They put fear in front of you because fear raises a lot of money and it moves people's hands to do and act. And they put fear in front of us and the fear is so everything we're gonna lose if the other side wins. And so let me just remind you of something and that is that when you feel fear, you run for shelter, all of us do. Which means you and I are going to run to a shelter over the next 100 days and then beyond. Now, this is only one of our fears. Some of us were diagnosed with cancer recently, going through financial problems, marriage problems. There's so many problems that cause fear in our life. This is only one of them. But when there is fear, I urge you to run to Christ. In Proverbs chapter 18, this is why. He says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous man runs into it and is safe. But a rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his imagination. You see, when an ancient city was attacked, those that lived outside the city wall in the valley would run for cover behind the city wall. And if the city wall was breached, there was only one last safe spot to run to, and that was the tower a refuge, a fortified place with food and with water where people could gather. And so long as there was food and water, there was survival. A strong tower. And what the Bible teaches us is that Jesus is the only strong tower today and every day, and everyone who runs to him will be safe. But our problem is we are all tempted to run to imaginary towers. He says that a rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. It's an imagination. I want you to know that the, all, the, all these towers that are imaginary, they seem so tall and they are so short. Some of you are really wealthy. And you look at that wealth and you're like, it is an unscalable wall. God Almighty can take you home today and all of your resources will be allocated to others. It is a short wall. And our imaginary towers are plentiful. They can be career, they can be money, they can be sex, they can be drug, they can be drink, they can be election result, they can be politician. The latter we set up as an imaginary tower 
In spite of the fact that Psalm 146 says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there's no salvation. And so friends, let me remind you that this election and every election is gonna test your tower. You're gonna run somewhere. Run to Christ. And the second application is let's develop as God's people political views in light of Christ's word. And let me just say, and not the other way around. We all have ideas, right? You have, you have ideas. If you were president, you have ideas. I have ideas. We all have ideas. But let me tell you whose ideas matter. Jesus, because he's the sovereign king of heaven and earth. And only to the extent that our ideas align with his ideas are those ideas good ideas. He's the Lord, and he has spoken to us. I'm going to encourage you, and I don't even really have to encourage you, you lean toward a party in America. For some of us, that's already on our driver's license. Right where we say, We're affiliated with this direction or this direction. All of us lean towards that. And if you don't lean because you've never thought about it, that article that I wrote perhaps will even help you consider how you go about even that leaning process. But let me tell you, in either direction that you would lean, something about what you're leaning toward, it is broken. Neither political platform in America proclaims the truth of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus as the hope of the world, and therefore neither is the hope of the world, and neither should be the message of the church. And yet how utterly confusing it is to the watching world when they see believers in Jesus Christ proclaiming Jesus Christ and then justifying behavior within their preferred political party that looks nothing like him. And so we lean. And there's reasons to lean. And yet what we're leaning toward will not exist in heaven. It's broken. It's burdened. And so The election is going to test the loyalty of the people of God. What do we talk about most? What do we love the most? What do we grieve the most? As followers of Jesus Christ, we should absolutely grieve when we see the disregard of God's moral law becoming central pillars in any political platform. And we should also grieve when candidates clearly care more about leveraging moral issues that attract the Christian vote more than they care about those moral issues or in becoming a godly leader themselves. But when we get so entrenched into our party, it's easy for us to justify or sweep under the rug the very things that Christ Almighty has condemned. And as such, we can become as confusing as early American pastors who complicitly endorsed the practice of slavery in spite of the fact that the Bible condemns it. Christ has spoken. The king has spoken. In the Garden of Eden, before there was any sin in the world, he has spoken about the dignity of human life from the womb to the tomb. He's spoken about man's responsibility to subdue the earth. He has spoken about his calling upon our life that the primary way by which we would find substance and provision is through personal responsibility and working hard. He has spoken about marriage between one man and one woman being not only the foundation of the family and the home, but that the family and home would be the bedrock on which society would rest. He has also spoken about justice. He's spoken about poverty. He's spoken about immigration. He's spoken about the need to have godly and humble leaders. He's spoken about all of these things. 
And when we get so entrenched with what is broken, what you find is this, is that what comes out of our mouth is oftentimes more loyal to what we already know is broken than the kingdom that will survive and live forever and ever and ever without fault. What are you going to talk about? What we're all going to talk about is what we drink. So what do you mean? Some of them are going to drink deeply upon Scripture, and we're going to sip on political commentary for the next 100 days, and others are going to drink deeply on political commentary and sip on Scripture, and the world will know what we consume by what we say. And how tragic it will be for us, the people of God who have been entrusted with his words that help life flourish in his world, for us only to be able to echo the world's fear and folly at such a time as this. The second thing I want you to see is that Christ entrusts authority to government. Christ has all authority, we're told in the Bible, What that means is that if you have any authority over anything, it's on loan. If you have authority over yourself, that authority is on loan. If you have authority over your home, that authority is on loan. If you have authority at work, that authority is on loan. If you have authority in the country, that authority is on loan. It has been entrusted to you by the one who has all authority. Which is why Paul reminds the believers who are living underneath Roman occupation with emperors that we'll talk about next week that were some of the most perverse, ungodly leaders in the history of the world. And he would say to the people, there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. It is amazing how many believers wrangle over previous elections when Romans 13.1 sits in the Bible. I just wonder how those people got there. (laughs) You say, well, how is that possible for a good holy God to give us leaders that aren't good and holy? Because sometimes he intends to bless a country by their leaders, and sometimes he intends to judge. For blessing or for judgment, we find within the scriptures, Daniel 2 says he removes kings and he sets up kings. There are so many places in the Old Testament where he literally says, I'm going to utilize my servant Nebuchadnezzar in spite of his evil to bring about a purity within my people from their idolatry. There was an appointing of a holy God of an unholy man to bring refining judgment upon his people. You find stuff like that in the Bible if you read it. We just can't hardly imagine that he would still do such a thing. But he does. And Paul and Peter go on to tell us that God has given authority to the government for a purpose. In Romans chapter 13, verse 4, he says, the government is the servants of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And then Peter adds that emperors and governors are sent by him, that is God, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now, let's condense all of this into one slide so you can see it. Government is sent by God and entrusted with authority by God to do something, and that is to administer justice. And that justice It comes about in three parts that we just read about. As they commend what he says is good, as they punish what he says is evil, and as they protect the world from anarchy. This is their responsibility. When you find a government that commends what he says is good, 
who punishes what he says is evil and protects that people inside that city from anarchy, you find a government that is in alignment with God, and as such, you find a measure of peace and blessing that spills out from them. And as such, when you find a government who condemns what he says is good, and who rewards what he says is evil, and that allows a measure of anarchy in the city, the town, or the world. You find a government that is misaligned with God, and as such, they bring about not only a brutality, but a dishonesty that literally cripples a society. Now, I've used the word justice biblical justice. Their job is to administer justice. And we all live in a place to where we use the word justice and hear the word justice used in a way that's very different from how the Bible used it. We looked at this a year and a half ago when we looked at social justice theory. Social justice that most of us hear about all the time aims to bring society into compliance with our perceptions. This is the most important. It's our What we believe is right in our own eyes. Our perceptions are the rule. Our perceptions of inequity by reallocating possession and opportunity to the oppressed. Now, one of the things that's no doubt about social justice theory is there is evidence within the world of injustice and there is a mercy to try to figure it out. But most notably, it is not biblical justice at least not in every sense, because what biblical justice is, is it's just that it aims to bring life into compliance with God's laws, not our perceptions, what he says. By giving to all people what he says they are due, which is namely advocacy, impartiality, and accountability. There's no way for me to go into all of that now, and so let me just point you back to an article that if you want to see a comparison between the two, and how parts of social justice, which parts are in alignment with the gospel and which I believe are not, you can go, you can find an article called Social Justice and the Gospel at pray.org slash info as well. But let me move on with two applications for the second point. First, let me urge us to remember over the next days that God can even use what is corrupt. Aren't you thankful that we have many good and godly leaders. I'm dead serious about this. You hear leader and you constantly, all of us think of only a few names. But there are so many people who serve so admirably, seeking to commend what he says is good and to punish what he says is evil and to keep the world from anarchy. We should all be so thankful for godly good leaders. And we should pray for them as well. Next week we will. But we are also very aware that there's many ungodly leaders who do just what Romans 13 verse 3 says shouldn't happen. And that is that when a government is acting in alignment with God, they're not a terror for good conduct. And yet all around the world, we find leaders through history and even today who are terrorizing people who want to exercise and live with good conduct. Happens all over the world. You see it all over the Bible. You see corrupt leaders in Egypt, corrupt leaders in Israel, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. They were a terror, many of them, a terror to people of good conduct. And yet what I want you to remember and see is that God can use even corrupt leaders to bring about great good for his people. It's not his will, of course, meaning The goal isn't to elect terrible leaders so that we can showcase the grace of God or what he can do in spite of them. But when a leader chooses to misalign with the Lord, God can even use the chaos that ensues from that kind of leadership to bring about good. You say, well, how is that? I don't always know how he does it. I just read it in the Bible. Within the Bible, we see corrupt leaders in Egypt, and yet God used Egypt to display his power. He used corrupt, and there were corrupt leaders in Israel, but he used those leaders to create a longing within the hearts of his people for a godly and better king. 
With Babylon, he used them to purify his people. With Persia, he used them to rebuild the temple. With Greece, he used them to unite the world under the Greek language in which the New Testament would be written and spread quickly around the world. And you go, well, what about Rome? Those Roman leaders, they were terrible. Many of them were. We're going to look at three of them next week. And they are, man, they're a hot mess. I mean, it was amazing how they lived. Could God use Rome? to bring about good for anybody. Well, Acts chapter 4 says that there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, Romans, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so take heart, because even among some of the worst rulers in the history of the world, God brought about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that brings salvation to those who believe. And then the second application on the second point is let's see our role in governing. Sometimes when we think about this, we think about it as us versus them. We're like, man, those people out there, I wonder if they align with God. I wonder if they misalign with God. But what I want to show you is that we live in a constitutional republic, which is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And what that means is authority has been given first and foremost to the citizens, which means that we are part of the governed and the governing. We'll look next week at how we participate in being governed by things like paying taxes and being subject to laws. But we participate in governing in part by delegating leaders that we believe will administer justice by commending what he says is good and punishing what he says is evil and protecting the world from anarchy. And we, the voting citizens, are to be as faithful in delegating leaders who administer biblical justice as they are to administer that justice. God will examine their stewardship of leadership and our stewardship of freedom. And so I would indeed urge you to participate because God is going to hold you accountable whether you do and how you do. The last thing I want you to see is that Christ will hold everyone accountable. Everything that comes from Christ returns to Christ. Everything. And so in Romans 13, 1 through 6, when it says that the authorities, they come from God, and he calls them servants of God and ministers of God, what that means is all people, all ministers, and all servants from God return to God to give account. Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what is due. And so it would be such a miss for me to talk about politics in the world and not anchor it to the big story of the Bible so you see how it works in a story that begins and ends with justice. Within the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates us to have a relationship with him. And inside the safe confines of his just instructions, man knew perfect peace. But then that peace was interrupted when Satan came into the garden after trying to rebel against heaven unjustly, was thrown to the earth, comes to humanity on the earth, and begins to tempt humanity to question the justice of God. Did God really say, you will not surely die? And humanity sinned against God, broke fellowship with him, and suddenly there was an avalanche of injustice that swept over their own personal hearts, their relationship, and the world. And into this new unjust environment, God did something that is truly unthinkable, uninventable, and that is that he made a promise in that moment, a promise to send a savior. A special son would be born of the woman, and Satan would try to crush but would only be able to strike his heel, but the son would crush the head of the serpent. And so the Bible says that the solution to our sin problem 
is a war between an unjust Satan and a just son that would ultimately be won by the son. You fast forward in the Bible and move from Adam and Eve to a table of nations that spread across the earth with own unique languages. And it says that they're mistreating each other and they're mistreating the Lord and their sin. So God looks in all these nations and he chooses Abraham and he says, from your line will the special son be born. And this promise of a special son moves through literally centuries of time of prophets and priests and kings. And when we get to the kings, we keep finding that God's observing everything that is happening. We find within the kings that every government who aligns with God brings peace and blessing to the people. Every government that misaligns with God brings idolatry and brutality. And God pays attention to both. And so with every one of the kings, 43 kings, you find a summary statement either at the beginning or the end of their reign where we find something like this. Asa, the king, did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Ahaz did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then they tell their story. But what I want you to see is it's not so much that they did what was good or bad It's that they did what was good or bad in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't our eyes. There wasn't a jury. There wasn't a judge. There is God. It's his eyes. We will all stand before him who sees everything. And the biggest question that I have at the end of this moment is this. When you stand before your judge who is perfect and holy, will you stand on the right side of justice? That is the most important question that you can ask yourself today. Are you standing and preparing to stand on the right side of justice? You see, in the perfect time, in the fullness of time, God sent this son to the earth, gave him the name Jesus. He lived without sin, and then he went to a cross, and there he died to pay for our sin. He was buried in a grave, and then he rose from the dead. And when he rose, he said, you haven't lived as you ought, but I have. And if you'll put your trust in me, Everything that you deserve in your sin will fall upon me on the cross, and everything I deserve in my righteousness will fall upon you forever. I will take away your sin, and I will give you my righteousness so that when you stand in the courtroom of heaven, you'll be dressed with my righteousness. You'll be on the right side of justice. Friends, the day of the Lord is coming when he's going to return to the earth. He's going to crush evil. He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to reign forever. My question is, are you on the right side of justice? I urge you today to put your trust in Christ and be justified. For only those who put their trust in Jesus and only those who receive his righteousness will stand secure. And on that day, not only will every one of us be held accountable, But every single person who had received even a morsel of authority that was entrusted and on loan will answer to God Almighty for what they did with it. And so, relax. The king is on his throne. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you. We thank you for your kindness to us. And now we pray with that kindness, that you would lead us to repentance, that there's anything that we have been, that we have examined, that perhaps has seen within our own personal life that's out of step with you, that you would lead us to repent. Would you guard our hearts as a church family, as people, as we walk through this process? And would you give us peace that passes understanding as we run to the tower that is strong? We love you and we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.